Well, God, we thank you for the gift of faith, the gift of our parish community, and the call to serve that comes to life in so many wonderful ways in our midst. We thank you for all those we honor tonight, for steady, faithful, generous, and joyful service. We thank you that the good news comes to life in them and is proclaimed for us all to hear and to imitate. Help us to give thanks tonight and help us all to rededicate ourselves to follow their example as they follow Jesus. Mark our celebration tonight with a spirit of joy. May your Holy Spirit dwell among us and continue to animate us as your children. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Father. Now, to get you all in the mood for this evening and what the Heritage Fund represents, I know some of you are eating and drinking, but play along with me here. Close your eyes for a second. Do you see the darkness? That's what the children here at St. Elizabeth's will be reading in if you do not donate to the Heritage Fund. <laughs> you have to keep the lights on because you can't learn in the dark. That's one thing I've tried and it does not work. Um, we'd like to thank the nominating committee and all of, our, all of our volunteers tonight for making this a great event. We'd also um, like to help thank everyone else who made this a great event and who helped us play in this tonight. So let's give a nice round of applause for everyone who did anything to make this great. For those of you that don't know, my name is Brian Fleming. I'm from the class of 1991, the fantastic Sadie's class of 91. I'm so excited to be back here. You know, it's so fun to come back every year because this room down here, especially with Ms. Zonka and Jenny Burns and all the, all the dream team that we had down here was such a foundational spot in my life. And I really love coming back to St. Elizabeth's because it's so fun. Now, I know you guys are looking at me and saying, well, he didn't turn out that well. Um, but, you know, that's really not an indictment on my teachers, so please don't hold it against them. Uh, our first nominee, our first entrance into the Hall of Fame this evening are two of my personal teachers, and a lot of people in this room had them as well, Miss Barbara Daniels and Ann Halpin. Um, Ms. Halpin has passed away. Ms. Daniels couldn't be with us tonight because she's quite ill as well. Um, but we wanted to make sure that those two went in together. Anyone who remembers this duo from St. Elizabeth's, whether you were a parent, a student, you remember this dream team of teachers. Um, a lot of people said, and I've talked to the Halpin's family, that they were a little bit strict, and I think I would agree with that, um, to say the least. But an old alumnus said, if you survived fourth grade, you were ready for Easy Street with Lynn and Lancaster. So, <laughs> so to bring our first two entrants in tonight, John Lillis from the class of 83 would like to say a few words about these two fantastic teachers. John, come on up. First of all, I was a class of 80, not 83. I graduated high school in 84, so I would have been one year at Rockers. That would have been pretty incredible for me. Um, I, you know, I was, when I was thinking when they asked me to speak tonight about Mrs. Halpin and Mrs. Daniels, I kept thinking, what am I going to talk about? I kept, the word foundation kept popping into my mind. They laid the foundation for, in fourth grade about your Catholicism, your being a good citizen, being a good student. They laid that foundation for all these teachers did from this, from this school. They all laid that foundation for us. And we were so lucky at St. Elizabeth's to have these great people that taught us, that influenced us. And I can't say we, our parents made a great choice to send this here. And I would like to thank the rest of the class. I congratulate them on coming in. Then I'll start talking about Mrs. Halpin first. Well, I know in third grade they told us, just wait till you get to fourth grade. Mary Lee would tell us that. Mrs. Burns would tell us that. Wait till you get to fourth grade. You're gonna have homework. They're strict. They're gonna make you grow up. So, you know, it's like, oh my God, what are these ladies gonna do? 
to us, you know, so it was a challenge. So they were ready, the bees two ladies were ready for that challenge. I think both of them, they were maybe 5'2". I think Mrs. Halpern was taller than Mrs. Daniels. Mrs. Daniels was probably 4'11 on a good day. But Mrs. Daniels, she looked up from her glasses and she put the fear of God in you just by her look. I don't know what she had, what she did, but she was so intimidating. I remember my first day of fourth grade, a girl was dotting her eyes with a heart. And this is a true story, I won't mention her name, Megan O'Leary. And she said, we don't dot our eyes with hearts in fourth grade. That is over. That took care of dotting the hearts the rest of the year <laughs> in our fourth grade class. So that kind of tells you the, the, how they started out. But you know, so it was kind of, and Mrs. Daniels and Mrs. Halpin, I think if you look up the definition of team teaching, they probably have a picture of both of them and that's in Webster Dictionary because I think they brought that term to light because they really worked together so well. And Mrs. Halpin, she was, uh, I'll just kind of read what we, some of the stuff that I got from some of her students and her children. Her first teaching job was in a small school in Easton, Kansas. I mean, she met her husband, Ed. They were married, moved to Kansas City. And they started a family. And Mrs. Halpin started to teach here in 1966 and left in 86, as best as anyone can tell. I asked that said that I didn't have Mrs. Halpin. She said I was in 86. And she was a stern lady. She taught uh, science and English, as I remember. And she gave, but one of the things she liked to do was give her students the St. Nicholas Day. She would celebrate St. Nicholas Day and put candy in, um, in your shoes and a pencil. And she kind of liked it. And I remember that very carefully. And she, but the funny thing, I did not know this until I got this from one of her daughters, that she had to get a special parking spot when she first started here because her car would not go into reverse. <laughs> and I think she missed a park on the street at her house, I'm sure. And that kind of explains a lot about Mrs. Halpin. She's always going forward, never backwards. I mean, she was, some of the students I asked were saying, like she would say, she's like, she's always ready to stretching or doing like aerobics in class, because she would never sit down in class. She'd always move around the classroom, just always was like a constant buzzing around. So maybe she was just always ready to go forward, never backwards, I, I don't know. And I remember seeing Mrs. Halpin at Coach and Mrs. Davis's house a lot, playing bridge or cards with the other teachers like Mrs. Miller and some of the other old timers teachers that were here forever. And I remember seeing her smoking. I was like, oh my gosh, she really, she's like my mom, she smokes. And then, then I was like, well, she, and she was drinking iced tea. And one of my brother's sisters said, that's not iced tea, you dummy. You know? She's like a regular lady, she's like a regular mom. So it was kind of cool to start that light too. I remember very much her being over Davis's playing bridge with Mrs. Davis and Coach talked about something. And she always had hard candy. I don't know if it was dry in that fourth grade classroom, but she always had like a hard candy cough drop or something going on in there. And she was always sucking on a, a peppermint or a cough drop, or, which I didn't think was very fair. She wouldn't let us chew gum, so I didn't think that was very nice. But and her, 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 she always felt that teaching at St. Louis was more than just, it was more than a job for her. She really loved teaching. And, and she made it her social life as well. She had some great friends come out of here with uh, Mrs. Daniels and Mrs. Davis and or Ann Ortega and Denise Gilmore. And she thought Mrs. McInerney, the principal at the time for most of her duration here, was a, uh, would walk on water and was a brilliant person. One of her best friends, they said, was Mrs. Lynn, Mrs. Carol Lynn. She's like a sister she never had. I'd ask for a new sister, personally. And one student told me how she would She'd get mad, and I do remember this. She'd get mad, and she'd open all the desks. The matter she got, the more drawers and stuff she'd open in her desk. And she'd just slam them one by one and start yelling at us. And she'd get mad, and it's like, oh, gosh. You know, so she did stuff like that. And she always kind of made it fun. But one of the things that I think one of the students really stuck out to me is that she encouraged creative writing. In fourth grade, I just can't imagine a fourth grade teacher encouraging creative writing, because God knows what those kids would write about. But she encouraged that. And we have a lot of writers that have come through here, gone through the school. And she's probably the start, the foundation of those kids' creative writing abilities. So I think that's one thing that we really need to say, wow, Mrs. Halpin, great job. Great job. So she was a good mink lady. And I have one story about my brother. My brother was a teacher at St. Thomas Aquinas for a lot of years. And one of her granddaughters came up to my brother, I don't know which one it was, and said, my grandmother taught you. He said, well, 
who's your grandmother? He goes, he goes, can't help it. He goes, he looks at her in a stern face and says, I never liked your grandmother. <laughs> and, you know, you were heard the term he makes her a bitch. He just, he just kind of let her string her out, string her out. Said, well, your family will be okay in my class. So he took care of her from there on out. But uh, I would say great job, Mrs. Halpin, and thank you. And we were thinking of you tonight, and we appreciate all you've done for us at St. Elizabeth's. And now for Mrs. Daniels. Like I said, she was maybe five foot, four eleven, had a stern look, but never, no boy ever crossed her. She loved the boys, but you know, she took all the boys. She said they didn't. She just was. You never crossed Mrs. Daniels because there was she put the fear of God in you. And and she was very organized, very structured, and she liked the kids that played sports. She always did. I remember going over to her house when we were little. My brother and Tommy were classmates, and she had. The thing, they had like a pinball down in the basement, which I thought was pretty cool. They had the <laughs> coolest thing I've ever seen in my life at the time. Well, they had an indoor vacuum in the wall. They had a vacuum on the wall. You just go stick this apparatus in the wall, and she would, and you would just vacuum. I thought that was so cool, and I really liked vacuuming, kind of like Dave does. You know, we like that vacuuming stuff. I think Andy is uh, kind of in that way too now. So we like the vacuum, and so it's like it's so cool. And she explained to me how it works. She's like. I'd get over it, you know? So I'm sure she was always, like, thought that was kind of weird. And she never used many words to get her points across, Mrs. Daniel. She didn't have to. She just told you how it was and this is the way it's going to be. Now, we had this thing in fourth grade. And I was, if you had this, we had over class, you remember the Asian projects. Oh my God, those were so hard. Those were the ones when you said it's time to grow up in this fourth grade. You had maps, you had charts, you uh, you had rewrites and rewrites. She would check it every Friday and every Sunday. You couldn't watch TV because you had to do the rewrites for Mrs. Daniels. And it's like, oh my God. And so it's just things that took forever. It's like all semester long, I think. I, and it was like a big chunk of your grade. You had to write about Japan. And Mrs. Halpin would throw in there and say, you know, Japan has a lot of iron mineral or something. So she would try to get you to use some of that in a report. And so that, that was team talk, team teaching again. And but Mrs. Daniels just kept going on and on about this thing. It's like, like it took forever to get this thing done. So, you know, being the student that I was, that we, when I went to good high school, got my college degree, got my MBA in business, and I still have this one thing holding over my head. And I'm going to have Mrs. Lynn, since we're going to give Mrs. Lynn the uh, presents to Mrs. Halpin's family and Mrs. Daniels. I need to turn in my final report. <laughs> then she, you know, it was just, it was a really hard report, trust me. But then I have another quick story about my brother, Tim. I have to share. Mrs. Daniels called her house one night, talked to my dad, said, Tim did something at school, and I got this note back for him signed by Janet. I don't think Janet signed it. Dad goes, why didn't you why didn't see Janet sign it? Well, Mrs. was misspelled. <laughs> and so Dad told Mrs. Daniels, that will never happen again. I'll find I'll wrap around the butter of the telephone bowl if you ever does that again. <laughs> so it was, it was my great honor is to put Mrs. Daniels and Mrs. Halpin into the St. Louis Hall of Fame. Congratulations. <laughs> appreciation for everything Mrs. Daniels and Mrs. Halpin have contributed to the St. Elizabeth's community. We would like to present their family members with a gift here. Uh, if you guys would come up, I would, or if a representative from the Halpin family would come up and we'll get it to our favorite purple cow, Mrs. Lynn. Um, and does anyone want to say anything from the Halpin family? Carol? I know you're. I know it's surprising that you're a teacher and you have fear of public speaking. But would you like to say anything? They're beautiful people. Is what she was her sentiment was. So one more time for the fourth grade dream team of Bob Daniels and Ann Halpin. To the guests who are presenting with them tonight, the brick, uh, they'll also have an engraved brick in a special Hall of Fame section. 
and again, it's only fitting that these two are together uh, in perpetuity out there. So, um, and for the record, John Lewis really did graduate in 83. He was held back three years, and he is embarrassed to say that. He was supposed to be in 80, but he actually finished in 83. So let's give a big round of applause for John Lewis finishing in 83. Our next honoree tonight is a gentleman who was also here uh, while I was here. He's a fantastic priest, and he has now uh, achieved the rank of Monsignor. Monsignor Robert Gregory served as St. Elizabeth's associate pastor from 76 to 79, and as pastor from 93 to 2005. Because of the growth in the membership and school enrollment in the 90s, the need for additional upgraded facilities became apparent. Monsignor Gregory's leadership was instrumental in doing the Miracle on 75th Street campaign which basically made a lot of the school that we're looking at today. So here to say a few words about my friend and yours, Monsignor Gregory, is longtime parishioner, Tony Walters. Let's give her a round of applause. upstairs. Uh, Father Greg, or Gregory, and Father Greg Heskamp have been here two times, either as, as a assistant pastor and as pastor. And that's a lot of years with the Gregory around, so <laughs> we might give that some thought. <laughs> Monsignor Gregory, we certainly welcome you here again at St. Elizabeth's. It's really uh, kind of a special treat to have you back. Monsignor Gregory, uh, you've been gifted with an honorary title of Monsignor, uh, which you so deserve, but you were a father to us when we were here for 12 years, so it will be a problem that we will fall into, and I'm sure that uh, you won't hold it against us. But uh, I do hope that you will uh, always be that great father that you have been as you were here with us during those 12 years. Just some background information for those of you who may not know that uh, you were born October 19th, 1943 in St. Joseph, Missouri. And you were raised on a family farm in Houston, Missouri. Easton, excuse me. Uh, you were number 10 of 11 children. Uh, you certainly must have a lot of memories of your childhood. I think that's just a, a blessing to have been around so many siblings. For your high school education, you went to St. John's Seminary. You felt the call to the priesthood and continued your studies at Conception Seminary. And then you were eventually ordained by Bishop Helmsing in 1969 for the Diocese of Kansas City, St. Joseph. For Father's first assignment, Father Gregory became the assistant at St. Patrick's Parish, taught in the grade school, he taught in St. Pius High School, and was also chaplain for a hospital while being a full-time priest at the parish. That is an enormous load for a first assignment. In fact, Father took a leave of absence to discern the future of his priesthood. And I'm sure he had many conversations with our Lord during that time. However, your time of discernment led you back to the service in the priesthood. And then on to St. Elizabeth in 1976 as our assistant. You were here for three years and then assigned to other parishes, and then finally back here again as pastor of St. Elizabeth in 1993. Father Gregory was here with us for 12 years as our pastor. Jim, Jim Walters, my husband and I got to know Father Gregory very well over those many years because of our teaching and our work in the RCIA. Father Gregory was always available for any need regarding discernment and counseling. In 
preparing candidates who wanted to join the catholic church i certainly appreciated his generosity and his time and his help over those many years i know you father were very busy with the school and creating new classrooms and space and expanding the building the school has served our parish well and you also kept the church in good shape your great interest in religious art shows in the beauty of our church and our school during your years here we were most grateful for your presence in celebrating the sacraments in our midst and in our needs thank you for baptizing our babies our children and the adults in the rcia the rite of christian initiation of adults thank you for the many opportunities to celebrate the holy spirit in our lives through the sacrament of confirmation we were anointed with chrism oil to help us keep our faith strong Thank you for your dedication to the Eucharist, daily mass, and communion. Through the gift of your priesthood, we were blessed to receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ. What a truly beloved, awesome gift for each one of us. Thank you for your officiating at so many weddings here at St. Elizabeth and helping us get a strong spiritual beginning to our lives as husbands and wives. Thank you for being here to hear our confessions so that our souls and spirits could be restored to the loving care and goodness that our Lord has for us. Thank you for the many times you anointed us when facing surgery, a serious injury, or an illness, or when dying. It certainly is a wonderful spiritual comfort. Although when I think back, you probably anointed my husband Jim Walters more than anyone else because of his quadriplegia and many illnesses over the years, and I thank you. I personally thank you for your comfort concern and prayers for me and with me upon hearing of the unexpected news that my sister, uh, Sister of Loretto, Sister Vicki, she had died in the Altiplano of Bolivia doing missionary work and Father came over to give me a visit as I was prepared to hear the news. Father, I'm Senior Gregory. Thank you for being our pastor, our priest, and Christ to all of us here at St. Elizabeth, and for those many years you ministered to us. And may your years ahead be abundantly blessed with physical and spiritual strength and peace. In the words of St. Elizabeth of Hungary, whose feast day is just upon us, she said, we must give God what we have, gladly and with joy. Thank you, Father, for doing that for us. Thank you, sir. You're looking at my mom, Tina Gray, and uh, the document in the Hall of Fame. up in the pulpit and he takes off his watch and he looks at it then he sets it down and the little boy in the front row says daddy what does that mean and the, but dad said doesn't mean a thing son doesn't mean a thing <laughs> but i'm watching the clock i'll give you 10 minutes um, the first 
time I ever stepped foot in St. Elizabeth's Church was on December the 24th, 1976. As Tony said, I had just uh, returned from a leave of absence, and the Bishop Helmsing signed me here as an associate pastor. Uh, all of my priesthood had been up north of the river, and so I had no cause to come down south and see what was going on down here. But um, from the time I walked into this church, I have to tell you, I loved it. I think we got one of the, per you've got one of the prettiest churches around. I love the church. I, a place of beauty to pray and worship is very important to me. A lot of priests, I don't think it makes any difference. And, and I've been in other parishes and we didn't have, you know, I mean, we had lovely chapels and, and things of that sort. But uh, this church has always been my favorite, you know, until I went to the cathedral. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just a different kind of, of uh, architecture, obviously, and I've used up four minutes already. So um, <laughs> then uh, after I got here as an associate, you know, associates have no problem. They can do anything they want. And uh, people will go to the pastor and complain about you, <laughs> but um, th they don't. Uh, they don't take their problems to you. So it's just a, a very special time of knowing people and getting to know them and love them. And uh, uh, then um, I always wanted to come back here as pastor. Honestly, it's the only parish I ever wanted to be pastor of. And like in 1992. Dick Carney kind of came up to me. Dick was a pastor here at that time. And he said, how would you like to be pastor at St. Elizabeth's? And I said, I'd love to be. And uh, the only trouble was I had to wait a whole year <laughs> until he left. <laughs> um, so I got here in 93 and left in uh, 2005. Is that right? You know, people say, how long is 12 years? I'll tell you how long 12 years is. Remember your first grade? Now you remember your senior graduation. That's 12 years. That's a long time, isn't it? Uh, the greatest thing um, that, of course, sticks out in my mind is the miracle on 75th Street. Uh, David and Mary Lee Kroll were just incredible to be co-chairs of that. Nothing would have gotten off the ground if it weren't for them. You are just the greatest and uh, wonderful to talk with and and to lead um, and to lift me up when I was just pretty well down and out. Um, uh, there's a lot of a lot of stories I can tell about the, uh, the campaign, um, but I remember you know we hired this uh, fundraising group you know who they don't raise the money for you but they make you raise it and. Uh, <coughs> So I had the assignment of like bringing in lead gifts of $100,000. And uh, so I had a list of about four people to call on. And um, so I lined up uh, uh, three interviews uh, with parishioners. And uh, they weren't exact, I, I was counting on 300,000 for that night. And, <laughs> well, I think I got 25. <laughs> And uh, that was the very beginning of the campaign. And uh, I remember uh, there was a prayer group that used to meet in my office over at the, uh, at the office building ministry center. And, uh, uh, you know, like Paul Heschmeyer was there, Dan Fish was there, uh, Bill Knipp was there, Don Schmidt was there. And I went in and um, I just broke down and cried. I said, I cannot do this. And uh, so they prayed over me, and uh, by God's grace, we got it done. We had, every one of you made the difference. Every one of you. And uh, for that, I'm eternally grateful. I remember those Wednesday nights that bring us over to the cafeteria, and you had to stand up, and I had, it's kind of like an AA meeting or something. You know, they'd say, uh, you know, the leader would have to stand up and say, okay. We called on 15 people this week, and we got pledges of $33,500. And how much did you collect? Well, we collected 10,000. You know, it was uh, every week uh, 
that kind of thing. It was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm gonna close, well, I wanna say something about uh, the lights going out. <laughs> now, when I was here, you know, our school endowment exceeded the million dollar mark. You know that. Did you know that? Did you know you got a million dollar endowment? <laughs> you can't get to the corpus of it. But you can spend the three thousand dollars a year you get on. <laughs> yeah. Did Pretty you know that? <laughs> you got a million dollar endowment for the school. Um, my favorite Shakespeare play is Henry V, and. Uh, if you've never seen it, there's a, a wonderful uh, uh, these, uh, digital uh, CD of the, of the play, but I think it's Richard Brenna plays Henry V. And uh, the story of, is, you know, very briefly, um, Henry, of course, is king of England. And in those days, if a king declared war, he led the troops. It's not like today when politicians in Washington call it a war and hide under the desk and send our young men and women to die. I think if they led the troops, we'd have a lot fewer wars. But anyway, so Henry was leading his troops, his English troops, across the English Channel, and um, uh, there were 12,000 troops the English had, and they were coming against French army with 60 thousand troops. And uh, the night before the battle, uh, Henry uh, gives the mo one of the most incredible, of course, Shakespeare wrote it, uh, one of the most incredible talks to his troops that you have ever heard. And if you, it's worth just listening to that. He talked to them and he said, generations from now, your children and their children will say, why couldn't we have been there for the battle that day? They, he, he told them how glorious the battle will be. And then he led them in prayer. And the next morning, uh, the, 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 uh, the battle starts. And it goes on and on and on. And finally, uh, the French troops are routed. And uh, they flee. And at the end of the battle, after the French have fled, there's a fog coming up uh, over the battlefield. And um, the English troops are picking up their dead and their wounded and carrying back to the camp where they uh, would be laid out. And um, when they're doing this, they begin to sing in Latin a beautiful song. And the Latin words are non nobis domine, non nobis, said nomine tua da gloriam. Not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name be glory. And that's the way I feel about the miracle on 75th Street, not to us, not to us, but to your name give glory. And that's, I think, probably the motto of my life. Uh, I don't take credit for anything, but God's grace is the, is the thing that makes the difference. And so when we accomplish something great like we did on Miracle on 75th Street or the Million Dollar Endowment or whether it comes to in, increasing the, the membership of a parish, whatever it might be, not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. Monsignor Gregory, the newest addition to the St. Elizabeth Hall of Fame. Monsignor, for the record, tonight we're not really going to be talking about positives with money. We're going to keep it a little more negative because uh, the Heritage Fund needs your help. So I don't know if that endowment really exists. So let's, Alan Langford, I'm looking at you. Get the checkbook out.
it, it could be gone. So but that's that's a topic for never. Uh, our next inductee is probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest personalities to ever come out of St. Elizabeth's. And that's saying a lot with a bunch of clowns that went to school here. So the German oak tree, Gretel Harper, was probably one of the most formative people and fun people to be around. She was our lunch lady before being a lunch lady was cool or funny or neat. She was just a great person. The students could always count on delicious meals. We all, uh, you guys are eating on the trays that we ate on in grade school in the 80s, and they haven't been washed much since then either. Uh, but we all remember her square pizza, her great fries, her scoops of mashed potatoes, which we have tonight that are being used with the ice cream scoop. These, it's weird, the things that you remember from your grade school. Um, and I'm sure Josh is gonna talk about this as well, but her birthdays, your birthday was a super special day at St. Elizabeth's when Gretel got word that it was your birthday. The thick German accent and the happy birthday to you was fantastic. So, uh, Josh Brewster is gonna come speak tonight on behalf of Gretel Harper. We're really upset she can't be here tonight. She is really upset and just was not feeling up to it. So, little known fact about Josh, he actually won the mashed potato eating contest four years in a row. So let's give him a big round of applause and say congratulations Josh. Thank you, Brian, for stealing the first half of my speech. So I appreciate that. Uh, forgive my uh, nervousness. I got a lot of former teachers in the room. Um, and also, Mrs. Kroll, who's being inducted. If you remember, if, if you all could imagine, our kindergarten room was back through those doors where the Fleming children are making a whole bunch of noise right now. Um, but we've come a long way, and uh, I'm very proud to be here on the night you get inducted. And, uh, Father Gregory and all, all the inductees. This is really just a special night. Uh, it's cool to see all the alumni here too. Um, so I'm truly honored to introduce Gretel. There's a picture of her and some schmuck that probably didn't even graduate from here. Uh, but there's Gretel, and this is just a couple years ago, but if you could imagine her 20, 30 years before this picture, um, and she was just a, a breath of fresh air. Um, what can I say about Gretel on a night like this when she's receiving such an honor? I think the fact that she was the head of the cafeteria and grown adults that are in their 30s and 40s and probably in their 50s still talk about her and tell stories about her um, says enough about her as being such a treasure and such an influence on all of us. I'm, I'm being serious, it's not just lip service. She was, uh, she was a motivator. <laughs> and uh, a disciplinarian, but also someone that um, everyone really respected. She is extremely deserving of this honor. So just a little about her. Uh, she you know, served through the 70s, 80s, and 90s here as our cafeteria director. Uh, we could always count on her delicious meals. This is the part that Fleming stole, yada, yada, yada. Uh, a huge hug was always there and the birthday songs, of course. And you know, one thing that, I, I think this is true, but for a long time, we were one of the few schools with a hot lunch program, which is a real differentiator for St. Elizabeth's. And um, you know, she, she ran that very well, and so that's, that's something that um, is very cool. Now, I was a relatively good kid here at St. Elizabeth's. I, I didn't push the limits of my teachers. Mrs. Lynn can attest to that, Mrs. Anka. Uh, I think, but uh, if there was one person I wouldn't ever dare mess with, and, if, and it was Gretel, uh, it's not because she was strict, she was actually very fair and understanding. The difference is she didn't take any nonsense, none. Uh, that's the truth. There was no room for it in her cafeteria, and if you could all just imagine, this was where four classes were happening, if you can picture that, but in our current library, that was the cafeteria. It's small. It was loud, but it was Gretel's turf. Um, and it, I swear, I, I, my kids go to school here and I can still smell her mashed potatoes. Um, and I tell you what, those are some good scoops going on back there, uh, but they still weren't as good as Gretel's scoops. I can tell you that. And her square pizza, it was what dreams were made of, uh, honestly. You, Pat, Pat and I, could you stand up, please? 
Pat and I would be five foot eight, 130 pounds, if it weren't for Gretel's square pizza. Uh, instead, we got a scholarship to Boston College to play football. Uh, you know, one thing, she, she drove an Audi. Do you guys know how cool Audis are? And she drove those up. We rolled up in our in our carpool in my conversion vans and my dad's Oldsmobile, and Gretel's there with an automatic lock on her Audi, making us look like chumps. Uh, so it was the price because you didn't want an errant kickball to hit that thing. We were all in trouble. She also donned a dog whistle around her neck that only kids could hear. That's a true story. Uh, if the kids got too loud, dog whistle. If guys like Steve Riker and Joe Van Dyke and Brian Legenza all got too rowdy, dog whistle. If the crowd huddled around Matt Kroll's new Reebok pumps and got too, too large, dog whistle. And also, time to sing happy birthday, dog whistle. Yes, with her arm around you, you she would leave the entire cap in song. It was the true highlight of the year for, for kids, it really was. Little known fact, she also had a football play named after her on her fifth and sixth grade football team coached by my dad, Rich Brewster, and Tom Steck. Uh, Steve, Brian, Joe, you guys can remember that play. It never failed. That was, losing was not an option on that play. Gretel, Gretel taught us that. But it's funny, you got, if you guys know that Elward family, a guy like Nick Elward would come into the football huddle and say, all right, Gretel's mashed potatoes, strong right, on set, on set. <laughs> You know, and everyone just had a straight face because we knew that losing was not an option on that play. Um, so I sent a, a note out to a few of the alumni um, just asking for stories because um, I think Gretel's spirit comes, she's, she's still around, it, but just her, her spirit uh, really comes alive through stories. Uh, the first of which I learned tonight, and Tara Fitzgerald McGovern back there is alive to this day because of Gretel. <laughs> Thanks to a chip lodged in her throat, Gretel performed a high mic. Stand up, Tara. Uh, yeah! That's a true story. I just learned that tonight. My son would be without a best friend if that wouldn't have happened. So. Uh, all right, so this one comes from my sister, Bridget Heos, from the class of 90. Uh, by junior high, Gretel and her crew were rock stars to my friends and I. I think that by that time we were all babysitting and we appreciated what it took to keep a hundred rowdy kids in line. We'd also taken a shine to their delicious homemade desserts, especially the spice cake. A couple times we had some free time and found our way into the cafeteria where Gretel, true to her hospitality, gave us each a cookie, which was very delicious, and she was always very sweet as she was strict. And Kyle Twinner, the class of 91, uh, he said, I was in elementary when the lunchroom got the first microwave. This is, this is a good one. Uh, this fancy new machine was the tip of the spear and the latest technology, technological advance on campus. More than once did kids accidentally put tinfoil in there and sparks would go flying. Gretel had to counsel us on how to properly operate a microwave since many kids didn't have them in their homes yet. The lecture would always begin with the whistle, followed by a long pause followed by the stern counseling session. Great memories and a very good teacher, obviously, since we all still remember. Yes. This one comes from a non-student, my father, Rich Brewster. <laughs> so, if you can imagine him pinning this. So there I was at St. E for Teacher Appreciation Day, circa 1993 or 94, and after a grueling hour or two guest lecture to the seventh and eighth grade class, I found myself down in the cafeteria and thought it would be fun to initiate a good food fight <laughs> as the theme that year was school spirit. I got things started as some kids seemed shy by tossing some food morsel down the table, which generated some laughter, and a few morsels were thrown back toward me, and it looked like things were about to get really rolling when a shadow fell across our table, <laughs> and I saw a tall German lady at the doorway to the kitchen, and she was apparently blowing a whistle. Although I could not actually hear the whistle, the kids obviously could. <laughs> as they immediately rubbed their ears and quietly began to eat their lunches. <laughs> Having restored order, Gretel searched and found the offending stranger and gave me her best, not in my house, <laughs> message received. 
And then uh, Mike, Mike King from the class of 85 said, one fond memory of Gretel that will always stay with me was relative to her kind-hearted nature. I hated drinking plain milk with a passion so much that I would try to give it away with my lunch or try to and sneak it into the trash can each day. It was so bad that my mom would pay surprise visits to ensure I was drinking my milk and even corroborated with Gretel on efforts to get me to drink it. I guess Gretel must have had a soft spot for me because after this went on for weeks and months, she started giving me chocolate milk in place of my regular milk, which I loved. And he wants to say, thanks to you, Gretel, I grew up big and strong, just like you said I would. <laughs> and what I remember most about Gretel was those days where you forget your lunch money, or maybe your dad needed it for the parking meters <laughs> outside the courthouse later on that day. But, uh, regardless, you'd explain your situation to her, and it wasn't like going up to somebody that was easy to, you know, ask something for, you know, there was a stern face waiting, um, and you, you know, you'd explain your situation and, and look her right in the eye, because otherwise you weren't going to be acknowledged. And you'd ask for chocolate milk on credit, and you kind of like show your pockets being empty, <laughs> or show the black eye that Matt Kroll probably gave me, uh, <laughs> taking my lunch money, but I'm not mad. Uh, but she would smile and give you a nod of approval and hand you that milk each time. She just hand it right on over. So she always greeted us with a smile, but she also expected us to be kind, courteous, and mind our manners, just as our parents and teachers would want. So for that, we are eternally grateful for Gretel. And I am extremely honored to uh, present this to her. And we're gonna have, uh, fittingly enough, uh, the current cafeteria director, Missy O'Connell, come on up and just accept this in, in her honor. Thank you. A singing legend, Gretel Harper. One more round of applause. A special gift that Gretel is getting is Josh Brewster and the Kroll Boys are going over to her house tomorrow to rake her leaves. So, <laughs> bundle up, boys, it's chilly. And Josh, I'm really glad to let you out of your facility tonight. You look great. <laughs> Our final honorees tonight are, again, part of a foundation family of St. Elizabeth's, Dave and Mary Lee Kroll. Very uh, special to my heart personally, but also to the school in general. Uh, Mary Lee began teaching at St. E's in 1969, in addition to teaching various grade levels over a period of 20 years. Um, Dave and Mary Lee also gave their time through the Miracle on 75th Street, coaching, uh, P PTA, school board, all that good stuff that goes along with this. Um, some of you might not know, Alan Lankford, my eighth grade basketball coach is here tonight. Uh, killer season that we had that year, seven and 10, I believe. Uh, the previous eighth grade basketball coach was none other than Dave Kroll. Uh, he came to practice during my seventh grade year and saw my ball handling skills and my three pointer. And he's like, you know, I can't really teach that kid anything else. So I think I'm gonna bow out of the eighth grade job and hand it over to Alan Lankford so I can coach my punk son, Andy. But like Josh, I'm not mad about it. After years of therapy, I've come to grips with this. I'm sorry, I digress. Uh, but no, Dave Kroll, is a, he's an icon at the St. Elizabeth School, as is Mary Lee. Um, they're fantastic people. Mary Lee drove me to football practice, the Tom Steck, Rich Brewster football practice. And one of her favorite things to do was to sing Tell Me Lies by Fleetwood Mac, right when this came out. And she would sing it the whole way home. <laughs> There and back, so maybe we can get her to do a little bit of that later tonight. Um, here tonight to talk about my good friend, not the original Hawkeye, but the best Hawkeye, Peter Campbell is going to talk about Dave Kroll. Let's give him a nice round of applause. Together. time at the uh, St. E's Hall of Fame induction and uh, I'm really impressed and, and humbled to be here before you today. I look at the inductees, um, Barb Daniels and Ann Halpin, 
Uh, they call them the dream team, and, and it's fitting. The only thing more fitting might have been the nightmare pair. Uh, <laughs> and I mean that with all due respect. I am a teacher myself. And, and, I, and I, kinda, I guess I learned from them. Uh, I kind of strike the fear of God sometimes in my students' hearts, but it's only later, after the flesh wounds heal, that you, uh, you come to grips with what awesome people they were. I learned to read and write, really, because of Mrs. Halpin and Mrs. Lynn. They did lay that foundation uh, for me. And then Mrs. Lynn uh, helped me diagram sentences until I bled. But uh, <laughs> you use it all the time. Uh, <laughs> But my kids say the same thing about algebra. So, uh, uh, Monsignor, uh, Monsignor uh, Gregory, uh, he married my wife, Kara, and I. So uh, he has a special place in my heart, of course. Um, Gretel, uh, I, I was shocked to learn that pizza came in triangles uh, and thought that it couldn't be called pizza if it wasn't in a square. And, and spaghetti red, for God's sake, was there any other color that went on spaghetti? So the people that I'm, I'm here with tonight and, and reading and hearing these great stories, oh my God, memory lane is just wonderful. Uh, I've never left, been back at St. E's and love the parish, love the community, love the school. So, um, But tonight, uh, I just want to say good evening and welcome. My name is Pete Campbell, uh, graduated in 1985. I too spent three quality years down here with totes in my lap and, and wonderful teachers and wouldn't have changed it for the world. St. Elizabeth uh, Catholic Church and School have been in the Waldo area for almost 100 years. I need a mic stand here. Um, there's so many wonderful people that have contributed to the proud legacy that our church and school have established in the Kansas City area. Many of them have grown up not too far from 74th and Maine. However, there are some who come to us from other parts of the United States. A select few come from the great state of Iowa. And one in particular came to St. Elizabeth from a humble little town in Northwest Iowa called George, Iowa. David Lee Kroll, you could say, came to Kansas City area. Actually, I was told he hitchhiked from Iowa City. Came to Kansas City chasing a girl. That girl became his bride over 40 years ago, Mary Lee Reardon Kroll who is also being inducted into the Hall of Fame tonight. Dave grew up in Iowa playing every sport he could and excelled at pretty much every sport he played. After scoring 44 touchdowns at George High School in football, winning the 60-yard dash at the Iowa State track meet, of course, Dave decided to play baseball for the University of Iowa. While playing baseball for the Hawkeyes with the likes of Royals world champion Jim Sungberg, Dave decided to walk on to the Iowa football team his senior year. Why not? He not only made the team, but he contributed greatly as a wide receiver making catches on national TV in a game against Michigan State. Dave was even drafted after college by a Major League Baseball team, the Montreal Expos. He even hit a grand slam for their AAA affiliate team called the Winnipeg Whips. Yes, he did. While Dave played football at Iowa, he was teammates with two guys that remain close friends even today, Carrie and Jerry Reardon, Mary Lee's brothers. They've also played with a guy named Roy Bash, who was a St. Elizabeth parishioner, and Roy played an integral role in Dave and Mary Lee coming to St. Elizabeth, and eventually getting married here at St. E's, and raising their two sons, who you've heard a little bit about, Matt, the class of 1990, and Andy, the class of 1992. Jerry Reardon, Dave's brother-in-law, asked one of his sons recently, who's your favorite person in life? Without hesitation, Jerry's son, son said, Uncle Dave. Aww. After illustrious careers as a train operator at the Kansas City Zoo, <laughs> school teacher, and usher, and usher at Royal Stadium, Dave got a job with Robert O'Byrne and Associates, now known as CBiz. Dave has been a loyal, hardworking, and true professional for one of the top insurance financial planning companies in the U.S. for over 40 years. While successfully working at O'Byrne, CBiz, he always felt the need, though, to give back. And coaching basketball at St. Elizabeth, in particular the eighth grade boys, was a perfect outlet. 
While Dave never played college basketball or NBA basketball, he had more to give to the Saints boys than basketball knowledge. He infused his passion, work ethic, and love of the game in all of his basketball players. He coached players to develop their life skills as well as their crossover dribble and their jump shot. Dave is, quote, one of the nicest men I have ever met. He is so friendly and upbeat. Even when he had both knees replaced, he was still the most positive person in the gym. This is from one of Dave's former players. Another former player recalls that Dave really cared about him as a person. Dave once noticed at basketball, either in games or practices, that one of his players, Todd White, was always squinting while he was playing basketball. He talked to Todd's mom and to Todd and suggested that Todd needed glasses. Sure enough, Todd did need glasses. Todd recounts, that kind of explains why Coach Kroll never, saw, never said, said I never saw a shot that I didn't like. <laughs> Todd did shoot a lot. For 17 years as a coach of basketball here at St. Elizabeth, Dave Kroll coached kids. And yeah, he coached basketball too. As a former player for Coach Kroll, I consider him to be one of my basketball mentors. As the head basketball coach at Rockers High School, I've established a coaching philosophy that goes back to my days of playing for Dave in eighth grade. Dave cared more about his players than he did wins and losses. In a day and age where grade school basketball coaches are being ejected from games, asked to leave gymnasiums, and putting their personal agenda above the love of the kids, it's my privilege to present those gathered here tonight, a man that never forgot, it's about the kids, not me. Ladies and gentlemen, the humble son of Fred and Katie Kroll, and the pride of George, Iowa, David Lee Kroll. That's just one half of a fantastic duo. Here to talk about Mary Lee is a very close friend of mine and yours, my favorite, Maureen Liston. Let's have a round of applause for Maureen. logistics 
part of which which to take we had blackjack tables and we had to take the blackjack tables from the third floor of the school to the gymnasium and we didn't have this inner thing it was outside you had to uh, have enough gifts solicit enough gifts so that everybody who had money at the end of the night would have enough something to buy for their gifts or their tickets or their fake money whatever you had to ask people to serve as blackjack dealers and man the crap tables you also had to have enough food and drink so that everyone that came had something to eat or drink I guess it was a big project but in her usual fashion Mary Lee tirelessly worked and made everything come out in a, as a success we also used to have a social called the June Fest. It was uh, a community builder, probably a forerunner of the barbecue which we have now. There were clowns, games for the kids, um, music, ice cream and cake, and the famous citywide duo of Dan Walsh and Frank Schlegel who smoked anything that they could smoke. <laughs> food, food. <laughs> Each year, it became bigger and better. Mary Lee never did anything halfway. She was also in charge of providing the food for the 75th anniversary celebration party, another difficult undertaking that she did tirelessly. Outside this building, at the top of the stairs, to the west between the church and the school is a brick sidewalk with people's names on them. Mary Lee was asked to organize and handle the printing of these books and coordinate the installation of them. That meant making certain that everyone who had ordered a brick inscribed with a name was represented when the project was completed. It meant going down to the brickyard, handling each brick, looking at it, making sure everything was spelled right and the condition of each brick was okay. After finding a craftsman to build the sidewalk, she had to be on site to make sure that all the extended families that have always been and are still at St. Elizabeth's who wish to be represented in the same area, their wish was completed. It was a daunting task, but as usual, Mary Lee pulled it off. How many of you like to ask your best friends for money? Nobody. <laughs> Probably the most arduous task Mary Lee and Dave took on at St. Elizabeth's was chairing the miracle of 75th Street. This campaign helped our parish to build the new classrooms that connected the old school to the new. Mary Lee and Dave graciously accepted this leadership position and the task of asking families to contribute to yet another fund when most everyone was already tithing to send their kids to Catholic schools. I feel Mary Lee and Dave have an unconditional love for St. Elizabeth's. They always give 110%. They have wonderful talents which they willingly share with each of us. They have given generously of their treasures for the benefit of church and school. I think we're all very lucky to have Mary Lee and Dave as friends and parishioners. Thank you. Dave and Mary Lee Cole, the latest inductee to the St. Elizabeth's Hall of Fame. Thank you. Uh, anything early? Okay. <laughs> I, I figured that might be the case. Um, I didn't have any planned comments, but I, I, I feel a need to, to talk after what Peter Campbell said, which is so much appreciated, Pete. I can't tell you. By the way, he is the only player I ever coached that I had to encourage him to shoot the ball. 
And that happened all the way through when I watched him win a state championship for Rockhurst High School. He was the most humble, modest guy and was always the one that was the leader on the floor. Congratulations. Um, and Maureen, thank you for those wonderful comments. And Father Gregory, some of the comments you made. And I'd like to congratulate all the other recipients tonight. Um, you know, Pete, you, you, you hit a chord when you said came to Kansas City from Georgia, Iowa. And what I remember most is the, coming to Kansas City, St. Elizabeth was the first connection we had that allowed me to meet people outside of my brother-in-laws and the family. And thankfully, Mike Lillis asked me to get involved and be a coach here. And Mary Lee already had a relationship here because she was teaching. And I remember when we were dating, I'd come up and, and, and visit with her. So we got the opportunity to get involved in the community through St. Elizabeth's. And my God, what an impact it's had on our family over the 44 years we've been married. Just a couple of examples is the friendship that Matt and Andy have with the people that are here tonight. Hawkeye, too, is Matt's best friend. Greg Fendler is one of Matt's best friends. Kerm Fendler was one of our closest friends all the way through and hired our son Andy right out of college. And Andy now, is it 10 years, Andy? How long have you been at MedTrack? 14 years. Kerm Fendler has been the boss for Andy. I was fortunate to meet Bob O'Byrne because Mary Lee taught Joellen O'Byrne in third grade. Second grade, and so I got to meet. <laughs> so in second grade, Joellen was a student and had the opportunity to meet Bob O'Byrne. And 40 years later, I'm still working for the company Bob O'Byrne started, which is CBIS. So when you go all the way back to, the, to what got us involved in Kansas City, with St. Elizabeth's, and I will say this without any hesitation or reservation, this is quite an honor for us and we're very humble. But what's most important is, I can tell you today, there is no finer group of people to be associated with than the, than the parishioners of St. Elizabeth's Parish. Everybody here contributes, and you talk about us being sharing and, and getting involved and so forth. That capital campaign doesn't work without all of you. And just we were the, the people that were on the on the top and we're supposedly spearheading it. We, we got it going because of all of you. And everything about St. Elizabeth's is perfect. And you should be so proud of what you've created here. And for us to be inducted into this Hall of Fame is very meaningful. There are so many out here that probably are more deserving, and I hope you are inducted at some point, but to give us this privilege of now being inducted is very, very memorable. And thank you so very much. And thank you. things about Dave's speech stood out to me. Thank God he didn't have to hang out with the Reardons all the time. <laughs> that would get tiresome. And Kerm, thank you for hiring Andy. We don't know where else he would have gone. <laughs> it truly has been my distinct honor to be your MC tonight. I'm going to hand it over to Carrie Madden, who's now going to do the unpleasant part, uh, where she's going to talk about puppies and candy canes. So please <laughs> give your attention to her. Uh, and again, if you need free leaf raking service, please talk to my friends Matt and Andy Kroll or Josh Brewster or the thugs back there behind the bar. Have a good night. Thank you guys very much. because the work that is done here, I don't even have to say anything. I mean, just listen to what everybody said tonight. Um, 
I, I will be honest, when I moved here from Cincinnati, Ohio, I was floored that this school was funded, um, or that it was founded on the belief that if you are, are a child of an active parishioner, that your child, if you want them to go to school here, they should be able to go to school here, regardless of your ability to cover the cost to educate the child or not. No tuition. Absolutely blew my mind, didn't understand that. But it is because of the generosity of the supportive community um, that we are able to still do that. Um, of course, it's not always easy, and I'm looking around the room and there's a lot of people who have played a hand in not only being generous, but also really managing our parish's financial resources so that we can continue to do that. About five years ago, a group of past parents uh, realized that, you know, it's just expensive to educate little kiddos. And we do a really good job of it here. I mean, I can't pat myself on my back because I'm not in the classroom, couldn't do that. Um, <laughs> see what the teachers uh, goes out to you because I, I walk through the office and I go, okay, I'm gonna go back to the parish office now. Uh, it's always a little crazy over there. Um, but this group of parents realized that, you know, this is gonna be, it's all, the cost is only gonna keep increasing to provide this education. And so they agreed for a number of years to uh, match any donations up to $25,000 to the Heritage Fund. So since the inception of the Heritage Fund, we have been able to uh, raise $210,000 towards the school. 